Now on to the silent crisis in our nation's maternity wards. African-American mothers dying at a higher rate than any other racial or ethnic group from childbirth related complications. Families affected by this tragedy share their stories on the day their lives changed forever. Janae Norman has this report. What was supposed to be the start of a new life turned out to be the end of another. 26-year-old Amber Rose Isaac was preparing to give birth at the height of the coronavirus pandemic in New York City in April when everything changed for her partner, Bruce. And I just remember staring and, you know, looking at her face and, and, and seeing how scared she was, panicking a bit. And so I'm telling her, yeah, we're going home. This is what we prepared for. This is what we were ready for. This is this, it's time. And she looked at me and said, yes, all three of us are going home. And that was the last time I seen Amber. Amber posted on Twitter about, quote, dealing with incompetent doctors. She died four days later. Bruce says Amber tried advocating for herself, but doctors just wouldn't listen. When she voiced her concerns to her OB, she was letting her know, you know, she's not feeling right. She's feeling a lot of discomfort. She's um, having shortness of breath. Um, and her OB didn't really understand. She was like, oh, well, there are other women who are working while they're pregnant. So that right there just told me she didn't really care about Amber. In a statement, the hospital spokesperson saying 94% of our deliveries are minority mothers and Montefiore's maternal mortality rate of 0.01% is lower than both New York City and national averages, adding any maternal death is a tragedy. Amber's story is not uncommon. July 2nd, 26-year-old Shaw Asia Washington died during an emergency C-section. And July 27th, Yolanda Kadima, a doula and mom of seven, died giving birth to twins, also during an emergency C-section. Experts like Professor Deirdre Cooper Owens, who's written about how race and gender impacted American gynecology, say the struggles these women face throughout their pregnancies and childbirth all come down to racism. You see that class and status tend to matter. The higher up you go, right, the kind of better protected you are. That doesn't exist for black women because we're all experiencing racism in the same way. So when I walk into the office, nobody knows if I'm married or have a PhD or what my income is. The assumption is I might be lying. Maybe I'm promiscuous. Maybe I don't eat well. I should still be given fair treatment and equitable treatment by my doctor. My first pregnancy, my birthing experience was pretty traumatic. And then he actually punctured my spinal cord. I was temporarily paralyzed. We were so excited about bringing Jason to this world, and then the last two or three days of that of, of his birthing process was was too tragic. I was bullied and I was abused um, emotionally and physically in the sense that um, consent was not asked for as often as it should have been. It took me a while to find a provider that I trusted and that respected me. We lost him due to what is known as HELP syndrome. We found out later on that his death could have been prevented as well as the traumatic birthing experience that, I experienced. that she experienced. So many black families with similar stories and these experiences add to a mistrust between the black community and the medical community, a relationship with a long dark history dating back centuries. Enslaved black women were experimented on, uh, particularly during the 19th century, so it, a little bit in the 18th century, but largely in the 19th century as obstetrics and gynecology became more formal and accepted branches of medicine. Marion Sims, known as the father of American gynecology, pioneers the surgery to correct this obstetrical fistula condition. People didn't know that he experimented on enslaved women. They didn't know that two and a half years into his experimental trial, when his white medical assistants quit, he trained these enslaved women to serve as nurses. They were still his patients. They were still his slaves that he either owned or leased, and they still served as surgical assistants. So that part of the story was left out. The success of James Marion Sims earned him the nickname of the father of modern gynecology but his legacy is marred by the fact he earned it on the backs of black slaves through non-consensual human experimentation without anesthesia. 
Now, doctors like Jennifer Lincoln, also an OBGYN, are fighting against present-day health disparities. To this day, black people are less likely to get the same treatment in terms of pain medication. They're more likely to wait longer in the emergency room. They're less likely to be taken seriously. It's a holdover from the days of slavery. And in my field, this plays a huge role in the black maternal and morbidity crisis. The call to action. Doctors, nurses, anybody in the medical field, check your implicit bias. Staggering statistics show black women in America die during childbirth nearly three times more than white women, making the United States one of the most dangerous developed countries in the world for black women to give birth. And doctors say the issue for mothers extend through pregnancy and postpartum and also impact black babies who are more than twice as likely to die than white babies. So higher rates of complications related to childbirth and pregnancy as well. It's huge and it's something that in a population, you know, childbearing women in general are young, healthy women. And then these are not women who should be suffering these extreme complications or, or be dying, especially in a developed country. So what do you think can be done for medical professionals already out there to address this? I think that in reading and listening and understanding why there is fear and distrust of the medical system, for certain racial groups, and it's not a personal thing, but this, this is a whole generational societal thing. I still have to stop myself every time I'm caring for somebody who looks different than me, and I always check. And I say, am I delivering the same level of care here? These important self-assessments could literally mean the difference between life and death for patients like Charles Johnson's wife, Kira. She died unexpectedly after the birth of their second son in 2016, and Charles says her death was 100% preventable. For what was supposed to be a routine scheduled C-section at our doctor's recommendation, and on what we expected to be the happiest day of our lives, and really walked into an absolute nightmare. The thing that's so clear to me is that Kira just wasn't seen and valued as human. She wasn't seen in the same way with the same compassion and the same empathy that the people that were responsible for her life would have seen their own daughters or their own wives or their own sisters. There's no reason that Kira should not be here today. Charles says for him and his two sons, the void left by Kira's death can never be filled. And we talk about mommy all the time. And so I made the decision very early on that I never wanted the topic of cure to ever be taboo or to be off limits. We do our best to remain positive and to celebrate her, but there is, my brother says it best, it's like there will always be an empty seat at the table. But he's using tragedy as fuel to affect change, starting Four Moms for Kira, an advocacy group aiming to change laws and prevent negligence from ripping apart any more families. As for Bruce, he's grappling with the reality of what should have been the start of his family ending tragically in the beginning of his son living a life without his mother. Now, all I can think about is, you know, Elias growing up without his mother and how he's going to feel when, you know, he's in school and they're doing Mother's Day activities and, you know, making Mother's Day cards. And e Elias is not going to have that that luxury. And it, and, it, and it kills me. And it kills me that, um, you know, whenever we go out to parks, we're going to see full family playing together and, and, and we're not going to have that. Janae Norman, ABC News, New York. Our hearts go out to those dads. Such a heartbreaking report. Our thanks to Janae. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.